I, I presented a paper akin to what I'm going to talk about um, in, at a conference in Estonia um, a couple of months ago, and some of you, um, I, I, they put it up on, online, and some of you listened to it. So I felt like, oh no, I've got to now change what I was going to say to you. So I'm going to use some similar slides, but I think I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction than I, than I did in Estonia. What, the angle that I want to take is to look at the sort of interaction between people in their societies. Weapons, um, as, a, as a form of technology, and space. And when I say space, I don't mean like outer space. I mean um, what's around us. Uh, and the way in which human culture and society shape space um, through uh, processes of culture and economics and politics. Um, and this they, they become an expression of who we are. So this, this space that we are in, this room, has been set up in a specific sort of way that is an expression of what academic conferences is supposed to be. Right? That when I ask the, the buildings and ground people to set it up, they kind of have an idea of what academics want. Because there's a culture of an academic conference. It involves that thing up there. It involves you all kind of sitting around, looking at a presenter, but also being in a sort of circular environment so you can argue after the presentation, <laughs> right? So there is a, a spatial dynamic to this um, exchange that we're in that is socially defined, culturally defined, um, and also technologically defined. And this is a technology too, right? That facilitates our interaction in a specific way. <laughs> you don't get tired. So a battlefield is something similar, right? It is a place or a space, it has the word field, um, in which people come together to engage in a certain kind of um, interaction. If we use, for the moment, Clausewitz's very problematic definition of war as politics, as a, a sort of, a, by other means, right? Political commerce by other means. The, the, the battlefield is the space in which people come together to interact politically in a specific sort of way. And so my question that I, I know this seems like a tangent, but we're coming back to, to robots soon, um, is that what shape is war? Um, that's the sort of uh, research question that I'm thinking of. And does the, sh the changing shape of war change the sort of technologies that are deployed in that space? Um, and the reason for me talking about this on this particular day is because I think that if we think about the politics and the social sort of dynamics that are reshaping the battlefield, it will help us understand why these sorts of um, solutions to the battlefield problem are being proposed. Um, to not see them simply as driven by, um, by technology, sort of inevitable technological development, but sort of responding to something. Right? That there is a cultural and social thing happening that these things are being proposed as a solution to. Um, and I think what's helpful is for us to not only talk about robots um, by themselves, but talk about them as in a, in a spectrum of different kinds of weapons technology. And think about the spatial implications of a weapon. So we've, had, we've talked about a few, and I'm, I was really happy and that um, Bob started talking about slingshots because and spears, because I think this is where we're going to start. So if you think about a human being, um, when, when I teach um, Introduction to International Relations here at Pace, I say that, that all of international relations is essentially about the interaction between people who are considered the self and people who are considered the other. Um, and the international relations part happens in between if we use this somewhat simplistic model, um, in the social, social dynamics that happen between people that we're considering us and people who we consider them. Um, but if the only thing, and war happens in that space, right? War is the sort of, has this fabric of social and cultural institutions that guide how that interaction, violent interaction between itself and other happens. If the only thing you have is your fists, you literally cannot reach very far, right? The, that, that interaction, a violent interaction between you and another person is actually very spatially defined, essentially by how far you can reach, 
um, which is maybe why ancient soldiers, Goliath is described as being huge, right? Because that would matter. Um, and um, by how far you can run or go without food. So it's, the warfare is without any sort of technological innovation defined by the space of the human body and how far the body can move. Weapons technology extends the space of war. Right? It takes it beyond the, the reach of the human body to somewhere else. And so it, the spear, for instance, moves it just as far as the end of the spear, or a dagger or a knife. A stone takes that even further, because it's where you can actually project it. And um, there's an interesting debate, which I think some of the detractors of um, the people who are advocating for robotic weapons sniff at some of the arguments that some of you have been making and say, look at the people in the Middle Ages. They, they hated it when people um, started using bows and arrows. I actually agree with the people who hated it when we started using bows and arrows. And I actually think it's worth us going back and reading those debates, even though it seems very anachronistic, because there were some very interesting um, kind of thinking about what does it mean that we can actually attack someone who could be on the other side of a hill, that we have no human interaction with, we can't see them, we can't empathize with them. Um, and so it's worth actually going back to those texts and thinking, Maybe they were right. Uh, maybe they had something um, that we could kind of draw. And so, that said, a spear point, or a stone, or an arrow, is essentially a point. Right? It's a one-dimensional point. Um, you know, it's, it's got some dimensions, but for, for the sake of argument, um, it's, it's a one dimension. And a lot of the, the law about a point will often talk about what's an appropriate target. Right? So it's saying, which of the many possible points is the appropriate point for this point to hit? Okay? And so the, the argument, the legal argument, will be somehow about, is it this point that should be hit? No, that point is legal. This point's okay. Right? So you'll notice there's a sort of strain in the law that is essentially about that. But then um, what we see in the history of modern munitions is the extension of that point, right, through dimensions in various ways. So for example, the bow and arrow is extended by artillery, right, it goes further. Or it's extended by, um, by the airdropped munition, which is not just a point, but it's a point exploding outwards, right, expanding the space into a, a sort of a, a, a dimensional kind of sphere, which Garrett, actually, I stole that point from you, so I give credit to Garrett, my student, who was in the break saying, what about, what about these, uh, these explosives are, are always inherently discriminate because it's not a point anymore. So thank you, Garrett. <laughs> so um, in addition to that, you see in the sort of 60s and 70s, with the Soviet and um, US sort of explosives industries, beginning to think about how you can extend that expanse, that three-dimensional expanse, through time. So you get the development of um, airdropped munitions that, uh, or landmines, um, or just manually laid landmines that are essentially a point that explodes, but it happens in the fourth dimension. It happens sometime in the future. So you can actually, the human body can exit the scene and be on the other side of the universe, not universe, on the other side of the planet, perhaps dead, right? And can still kill, right? Um, and so within um, the military, you get, um, I think I will come back to this in a second. I'll, I'll go to my pictures after I've talked <laughs> to illustrate. So what's interesting is when people have started thinking about minefields as a kind of autonomous weapon that extends your ability to kill through time, the legal response has not been about which point is appropriate. The legal response has actually been to say that, that to do that is wrong. That that 
weapon itself is malinsane, right? It's evil in and of itself. So it's not actually the point that it hits that's illegal. It's the thing that explodes because it, it, it extends it beyond what we consider the space and time, or space-time, that we consider appropriate targeting. Does that make sense? Um, so it's a similar kind of argument, but it's become a kind of more blanket response. What essentially we have seen um, in um, the development of munitions from sort of 1965 or 1964, the beginnings of the Vietnam War up until today, is that that minefield has become kind of expanded and, and outsourced and um, kind of hollowed out and kind of incorporated into the very fabric of human society um, in a way that actually extends through robotics, through um, uh, digitization, through cyber warfare, through things like Stuxnet, which take warfare into cyberspace. Um, a kind of weapon that is not actually separate from just daily life. <coughs> right? that, that there are are weapons that are, are inhabiting human existence, inhabiting the city, inhabiting the, the cyberspace and the spectrum. The signals that you use to navigate New York City on your phone to get here this morning are similar satellites and similar um, signals and using the same spectrum to target a munition. It's not somehow different in space. Okay? So this kind of creates the legal problem that, uh, that Thomas is talking about. Where does the war stop? Where is the edge of war, if war is everywhere? Um, and how does this create a new legal challenge where we have the laws of war apply to the space of war? It applies to the battlefield, right? Which implies that you have a field with like this silver line here, and this is like war law, and over here is peace law. And that line is a line in space and it's a line in time. And as soon as that line is crossed, it no longer applies. And part of the reason why people were upset about mines is because it crossed the, the, the temporal line once war was over. And so it, it was seen as somehow illegal because it, had, it, it would extend beyond this line into peacetime. But if you have this notion of law as being something that extends throughout all space and is endless, right? we don't have a date at which it will end, what does that mean? And so I want to give you that sort of conceptual, and I, I, I want to give you some examples um, while also timekeeping myself. <laughs> um, to, to think about this, I looked at um, the changing, changes happening in military manuals of the US Army um, in the way that they thought about military technology. And I focused in on uh, mines, booby traps, and IEDs because I thought this would help us to kind of think as of a kind of predecessor to killer robots. They are autonomous weapons, but they are sort of, sort of dumb ones, right? They're an animal one. Um, and to do that, I looked at, th at three military manuals. And I'll just um, start with this one, a 1943 manual. And essentially, what I find interesting about this is the way that they think about the minefield as something wholly separate from civilian life, right? And wholly contained within a specific space. And so you have here, this is from the uh, diagram from the, the manual, a line in space where essentially this is the friendly side and the enemy you can very easily locate because there's an arrow that tells you where it is. <laughs> right? And the, the, diff, the line between the self and other here is very clearly defined and the other is over there somewhere. And if you look at a Claymore mine, which is a US manufactured directional mine, it says on the front of it, front toward enemy. 
right? So there's a sense that the enemy is a locatable in a different space than you are, right? Um, and so it, it clearly sort of defines this. And I'll just show you some other examples that, that go in different. So here, um, here's another diagram from it. It has minefield, and then there's a line, a bar, piece of barbed wire of not minefield. Do you know where it is? It can be easily no. Um, and this, I think, derives from our understanding of the battlefield as being somehow overlaying minefield, right? The battlefield is a space a separate from civilian space. The civilian field, the farmer's field, is not the battlefield or the minefield. It's different. It's separate. Um, and there are different laws, there are different rules that apply. Um, but, <laughs> speeding ahead, in the same manual, you get a kind of undercurrent or an alternative discourse, a very sickening one, um, which sort of appears every now and then. It's not the dominant tone of the manual. But occasionally, you'll hear this sort of voice pop into the, the manual saying, or you could put it under a chair. Right? And then it gets really strange because it doubles back in on itself because it says you could create a minefield that actually isn't a minefield. You just say it is. Right? So it's, it's civilian space that is masquerading as military space. And then it says, in the next line, and then you could put a few mines in that. So it's a double bluff, right? But it's civilian space masquerading as military space, which as soon as the D-miner goes in and says, oh, it's fine, it's, this is a dummy minefield, and then discovers that it's military space. And there's sort of, um, uh, I can't remember the word for it now, but this loop, right, that is sort of double back on itself, kind of collapses in that moment. And in this instance, you begin to see the, 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 the possibilities that happened after 1943 when this manual was written, in which military space and civil space have been kind of looped in, to, in on each other and kind of intertwined. Um, and so the manual that comes out in 2004, that's an update of this, begins to notice it, but only just. <laughs> only begins to notice how these things are changing. Um, and so you see um, the sort of expansion of the minefield into lots of different arenas and zones that is beyond a very hard, like specifically defined space. It says, at the base of walls and fences, in rubble, under thresholds, under steps, behind doors. It's interesting that you never see the face of this person, right? <laughs> um, but they're wearing a military uniform, which of course, if it's behind a door, you don't know that that's going to be a military person. It's in civilian space. <clears throat> they also talk about, in a way that the 1943 manual does, the diffusion vertically. Right? That it's not only just a plane, but you could have a minefield on a roof, you could have a minefield in a tunnel underneath the, a building. So you've expanded this plane, the battlefield, into three dimensions. Um, then, it talks about these sort of um, <clears throat> this system here that can be deployed by an aircraft behind enemy lines, and then it will initiate itself at a predetermined time. So again, extending the, the minefield beyond uh, what you would normally um, have defined it in space, and also time beyond what you had initially been able to do just by deploying those mines with the human body. So what's, what happened is that the 2004 ma manual only briefly mentions that there might be a problem with using mines. Um, it never mentions the mine ban treaty, but it's behind, it sort of lurks behind the, the manual. And it says you can't use anti-personnel mines um, in, in civilian areas or anywhere outside of Korea. Um, and this is an indication of just how Mines really have become anachronistic. They're not used very many places. They've been stigmatized. They're no longer mass produced in many places. And so the mine itself has been collapsed into 
sort of civilian things being turned in on themselves and re-engineered and improvised into an improvised explosive device. So again, you have this sort of collapsing of military and civil space. And these have been so effective that within a year of this manual coming out, there's another manual that is put out by the, the military very quickly that has this sort of tone of panic. We don't know how to deal with these sorts of devices. Um, they, they are killing more U.S. soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan than any other device. Um, and so the solution, which I'll go very quickly to, that has been proposed as a result of this, is a sort of increasing automation to essentially do the same sort of thing, to collapse military and civil space in on and of itself, um, and to use American technological means to find those people who are responsible for doing this, um, and they say neutralize, but everyone knows what's coded underneath that, right? Um, where they live, right? In urban areas, in um, civilian space. And what I'm concerned about, what this means, this is my brief conclusion, that essentially it turns the entirety of the city, or perhaps the entirety of the world, into one large mind, especially if you start to automate more and more processes. Right? If the detection is automated, if the decision making is automated, if the targeting and the actual firing is automated, you've essentially turned the city into a meta mind, that's what I call it. It's sort of a system that kind of inhabits the civilian sphere um, and uses the civilian sphere, uses the civilian spectrum, uses the internet, uses civilian technologies that have been militarized into actually turning in on the civilian population, in on the people who are inhabiting that space. And I think that is a really, really tricky legal question. Because you can't say, wars over there will regulate it somehow differently. Because if the mine is all around us, how do you regulate the mine? 